On January 6th, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry left Israel-Palestine for the 10th time since the beginning of the current round of negotiations. Before he left, he held a press conference where he reasserted his belief in the need for hope. Uh, history's adversaries can actually become partners for a new day, and history's challenges can become opportunities for a new age. A week later, the Israeli daily Idiot Achronot published comments made by the Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Yalon in closed-door meetings. In essence, all these months, we didn't negotiate with the Palestinians, we negotiated with the Americans. The only thing that can save us is if John Kerry will win the Nobel Peace Prize and leave us alone. Only our continued presence in Judea and Samaria and along the Jordan River will guarantee our central cities and airport don't turn into targets of rocket fire. The remarks sparked condemnation from the State Department, politicians and commentators, and led to the minister apologizing. But while the controversy focused on Yalon's defiance of the Americans, little attention was paid to what he actually said. The headlines focused on Yalon calling Kerry determined and messianic. However, the minister's lack of faith in the American-mediated negotiations is not new. In fact, it's the dominant attitude towards the 20-year process that hasn't led to peace, but to the mass expansion of Israel's settlement project in the West Bank and the outsourcing of the cost of the occupation to the Palestinians themselves. One of the process's main failures is that the negotiations exclude the vast majority of the Palestinians, as they're either refugees, citizens of Israel, or living in Gaza under the Hamas government, which is not invited to the negotiations table. Even the Palestinian Authority, which has semi-autonomy in the West Bank, is hardly present. In October, its chief negotiators resigned, citing a lack of serious commitment from the Israelis and an inability to actually implement any deal that may be signed. However, one man has not lost hope. Mundib al-Masri is the richest man in Palestine. His efforts, alongside other Palestinian and Israeli businessmen, are largely responsible for this negotiations round even taking place. Earlier, the real news was joined by journalist Max Momenthal as we visited al-Masri's mansion, situated about the Balata refugee camp in the West Bank city of Nablus. Apparently, Mr. Masri has a taste for Italia, and I'm wondering if like the four tenors are just going to start being piped through speakers in the ground. Uh, we actually can't find where he is right now. Manib Al Masri. Hello, marhaba. Sabah al khair. This is uh, Leah and uh, Max. We're calling. We're just here at uh, at your estate. We were uh, trying to find you. Hercules is what I call him, Mr. Palestinian. I want Max to meet him and you to meet him, to tell you that I'm a Palestinian and I, uh, I represent the perseverance, the strength, the belonging, and uh, modesty. That's me with Mr. Arafat and with the Prime Minister of, uh, of Italy, Mr. Romano Brody. I look out your window and I see uh, bracha, and I see um, E1 being authorized. Yeah, the settlements right out there. There's a whole Nablus is surrounded with settlements. The peace process has been going on since Madrid, and they keep building more and more settlements. Um, they say they're going to keep the major settlements, um, and and then and they're expanding the you know E1 to cut the West Bank in half. So my question is, uh, what is your vision? of a, how a two-state solution can be implemented. We are destined to live together, Max. We're destined to live together. We cannot get rid of each other. We are destined to live together in peace and harmony, and we can do great things together. And there is enough land. I have some excellent friends from the Israeli side. They believe like I do believe, and we hope that they will wake up. Israel will wake up to say enough is enough. I think Mr. Mahmoud Abbas is doing his best to make real peace, and he's honest about what he's talking about, peace, and let's do it. And this is an uh, incredible gentlemen, tapestry uh, here. Yeah, this is the this is 17th century uh, tapestry showing the two women claiming the same child, and uh, Sayyidina, or Prophet Suleiman. Sort of a metaphor for the two-state solution. Exactly. 
As his custom with journalists and political delegations, Al-Masri invited us to join him for breakfast. I represent, I'm the chairman of the biggest company in the West Bank and Gaza. We came here after Oslo to make the political process. Al-Masri is a geologist who made most of his fortune discovering oil in Libya. He then returned to the occupied territories and together with other Palestinian billionaires in the diaspora formed Patico, the biggest Palestinian holding firm. Together, the new Palestinian oligarchs helped shape the West Bank's neoliberal economy. Ibrahim Shikaki is an economist in Ramallah and a researcher for the Palestinian Economy Policy Research Institute. Since Oslo, in the early years of the 90s, so let's say 93, 94, there was a huge blockade. So a large number of Palestinians lost their job in Israel. The PA came to the rescue with public sector. That's why we have something like 160, 170,000 Palestinians um, working in the public what, sector. I mean, what kind of resistance activities could or a resistance posture could the business community in Palestine take, in the West Bank specifically? Well, the main thing that businessmen, uh, the economic resistance, if you want to call it, uh, can focus on is definitely boycott. That's one of the main uh, targets that Palestinians should focus on. But Al-Masri believes in dialogue. In May, he spoke at the World Economic Forum alongside Israeli billionaires, urging for more negotiations. Uh, we, our worries is because of the status quo. We don't want the status quo. We, want it to, we don't want it to stay. We want to leave the status quo and have the two parties engaged, engaged in a very useful dialogue. But, I, but people say that you meeting with Rami Levy is a form of normalization. But this is, uh, this is, this is baloney. I'll tell Rami Levy, like I'm telling you, Rami, it's better for you not to be here. It's better for you not this land. You are sitting on a stolen land. It's our land. Then it, isn't it much better to tell him this than it's not sitting with him to normalize things. Tell him in a civilized manner what you're doing is completely wrong and you want to have a friendly persuasion. Earlier, you said uh, the culture of resistance in Palestine has been replaced with the culture of the paycheck. Can you explain that thought? Yeah, well, I mean, um, we have resisted since uh, the Nakba with the choke points, with the, uh, with the borders, with the blockade of Gaza, with the separation, with this thing. They, they succeeded in making us uh, believe or making us change the resistance into a... Um, the Czech culture. Do you think uh, these jobs and the kind of economy that's behind them, um, this new economy, is sustainable? As long as there is no freedom of movements of goods and services, it's very difficult for an economy to thrive. We export maybe less than $100 million to Israel, and we import maybe two and a half or $3 billion of, of goods and services from, from Israel. So it's not balanced at all. We are subsidizing the occupation. For The Real News, I'm Leah Tarachansky in Nablus, Northern West Bank.